Let's Get Printing with Zach Dewhurst is brought to you by Deco Network. Deco Network software is designed for the apparel decoration industry to keep staff and equipment running smoothly. Learn more at DecoNetwork.com. Hey everyone, Zach Dewars here with the Let's Get Printing podcast. Today, my guest is Eric Campbell. Eric has decades worth of experience in the world of embroidery and specifically digitizing. Eric, tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, hey folks, <laughs> if you haven't seen me around, uh, you might have seen some of my articles, you may have seen me educating, but uh, I've been in the embroidery industry for over 20 years, primarily as an in-house digitizer, but I also was an e-commerce manager and did a lot of other stuff in this kind of embroidery world. So running embroidery business, stuff like that is something that's not alien to me, but a lot of my work was really hands-on in-house digitizing, interpreting art, getting things ready and making solutions for embroidery. And uh, since then I've worked on all sides of the industry, including uh, working behind the scenes for software and currently working with software development. So I've kind of done a little bit of everything, especially around the digitizing field, but it came up really in a business to business, commercial embroidery sense, starting out from uh, operating machines uh, into being an in-house digitizer and kind of grew that organically. Yeah, sounds like you've done just a little bit about everything uh, in oh, the world sure. of embroidery. Um, you know, there's a reason why Deco Network is not called Print Network. It's because the decoration <laughs> industry is really printing and embroidery in a nutshell. Um, and, you know, embroidery has been around uh, for literally over a century. It just, the machines do yeah, a lot of yeah. the work. Uh, versus doing it all by hand, but there's a lot that goes into embroidery. Um, when I first started in the industry and I saw embroidery machines, I joked, it's a set it and forget it. Uh, if you remember the old uh, infomercials about the uh, rotisserie chickens, that, that was their slogan, set it and forget it, because, hey, some of these jobs can take an hour to sew, um, but over the years, as I've done a lot more of it in-house, uh, I have come to learn that there are a handful of um, essentially pillars that make up embroidery. And if you don't get all of them correct, you're not going to deliver the best results. And like Eric uh, alluded to, um, Eric's done a lot of um, educating on this in the industry. If you attend a trade show, uh, Eric's typically there running some type of embroidery or digitizing class. Um, you can also find Eric uh, writing articles for Graphics Pro Magazine. So um, if you're just getting started with embroidery, um, knowledge is power. The more you can learn about the uh, industry as a whole and specifically how to put out the best possible product, um, Eric's a great resource to uh, check out his uh, seminars at trade shows and his articles in the um, industry magazines. With that said, we're going to talk uh, about digitizing, hooping, uh, selecting the right backing, and how to make the machine uh, really do uh, its really put out the best possible product by making sure that the thread tension and other variables are where they need to be. But before we can get to a machine with uh, and start sewing something, it all starts with digitizing. And yes, yeah. from the print world, you're always thinking about vector versus bitmap, color separating. Digitizing is unlike any of that. Uh, before <laughs> something can be sewn, you need to uh, take the artwork and use digitizing software so that the machine knows where to lay down stitches to create the design. Um, Eric, tell us a little bit about digitizing and you know how it influences the final quality of the finished product. 
Well, I think the, the big thing that causes problems for folks, especially coming from print or graphic design, is that when you're putting something on screen for graphic design, maybe colors might adjust on the final execution. And yes, I know with printing, there can be small amounts of bleed, and there are things that you need to handle there because there are differences once we apply. The thing is, with embroidery, the differences are, are much larger between what's going on on screen. And in fact, the first thing I teach anybody who's digitizing themselves is to stop trusting the screen and that the screen is actively incorrect for what you're actually going to run. Um, when we're talking about embroidery, it's this very fuzzy process where we have threads that are under tension. We are literally punching thousands of holes through a garment with a needle and leaving a thread under tension through the garment. We're not, it's not like printing on the garment, we are punching through the garment. So we have a lot of stresses, which means there are things like pull and push distortion that makes stitches shorter or stacks the stitches longer. So like a, a, an uppercase column of satin stitches, like an eye, Uppercase I will always get taller and narrower every time than it looks like it is on screen. So the inability to kind of trust the on-screen version of things is the first thing. The, pro the process means that uh, the produce of an embroidery digitizer is never the file, it's the embroidery. And you have to see beyond what you're doing on screen and put in compensation. So you have to distort with purpose the way that you're drawing shapes, uh, the way that you're putting things together, to make them show up correctly on the actual design. Uh, if you draw a circle in embroidery digitizing software and it's a perfect circle and you fill it, the chances are that when you stitch it out, it will be an oval because of the pull and the push distortion that is natural to the process. So that's the first thing that causes problems. Uh, the second thing is that you cannot necessarily execute every bit of detail that you might in a print with thread. We are uh, limited by the thickness of the thread and the physical limitations of, like I said, stabbing a needle thousands of times and leaving all these little threads through our design. You often have to reduce your levels of detail. You have to uh, unpack the extra dense details inside of something so you don't have stuff too, too close together because that's how we create coverage with embroidery. We just put things close together. And you have to realize that your thread never gets thinner than its smallest width. It is the thickness of the thread that we are bound by and that thickness is going to determine how thin a line we can make and how many times we have to run over something in sequence, how many times we have to stitch a line in sequence will also make that line thicker, even if we're just using single stitches instead of something like a satin stitch. The physical limitations of embroidery make us do things to interpret the art differently. And if we get beyond all of that, just get, getting the thing that's in print to look the way we want it to on embroidery, there's also the entire level of um, artistic interpretation because embroidery is three-dimensional and textural. So the shapes that are in a printed design, so let's say we have vector art for a print design, we may have one block of color that is to be a letter. In embroidery, that same block might have to be carved up into five, six, seven blocks of stitching that have different stitch angles and different settings, even though it's a contiguous block of color in the original art. So all of these things kind of come together and let you know uh, that what we see is almost never what we get. And in fact, I would just say it is never what we get. The screen is generally lying to you about what you're going to see there. And if you don't understand the final translation, which is what happens when the file gets to the machine, you're never going to be able to digitize well. And unfortunately, to, to some degree, it also has a difference depending on what kind of materials you're using, what kind of speeds you're running. And depending on what material you're running on, you may have to make difference, uh, different kind of choices in your digitizing uh, as to what you do for those stresses. Same thing with things like that detail, depending at the scale you're at and the material you're running on, you may make different decisions about how to interpret that art into digitizing. So I think that's the thing that kind of uh, trips people up. They think of it as, as a conversion process, the way you might convert one vector file to another vector uh, file option. You might convert something from one piece to another, or even as retracing, like you would do when you're trying to get a raster file into a vector file, you have to trace that art, but you're still tracing what's there. With digitizing, you're frequently drawing shapes that aren't there in the art, but will result in the final look that you're looking for. It sounds complicated, and and it and it and it is when when you're getting started. And um, one thing I've always suggested to uh, clientele is start by outsourcing the digitizing to someone you trust, and and you really get what you pay for. Now there is embroidery software or digitizing software out there like Wilcom, among others. It's not cheap, and it has its own learning curve, and um, 
Eric and I were talking earlier, the worst reason to start digitizing in-house yeah. is to save money because time is money. And if you're not outsourcing it, you're having to use someone internally to do it and you're not really going to save much money. Um, Eric, what are some of the reasons that somebody should digitize in-house versus outsourcing? Well, yeah, and I mean, to, just a second, what you, what you said earlier, I mean, that's the thing I teach always is that that's one of the worst reasons, I think, to bring things in-house. Um, certainly, there can be, you can make this as a profit center, but we have to remember all the opportunity costs that come with someone having to learn and, and be engaged in, in digitizing. It takes time, and it's also something that has some kind of artistic skill to it. Even basic stuff does have some skill to the interpretation. However, the great things you can do, uh, I was an in-house digitizer for most of my digitizing career. And some of the things that enabled me to do were to do really quick turnaround work, where if you had stuff that had to be done within the same day, and uh, those who have followed me for some time know that part of what of the work, uh, what the kind of workload I did that required that was movies and TV shooting happening out here in Albuquerque, New Mexico, where I'm from. And when that was going on, you'd have somebody show up and they really had to have a turnaround where they're shooting that night they need designs digitized and embroidered within you know a five to eight hour span and the only way to get that done and to get it approved and ready was i mean you could have done something where you had a relationship with a digitizer who is on call but having someone in-house who could uh, talk directly to the customers so they also had creative input and development that was being done in-house and who could then turn around and get that work done immediately uh, that's something that you really have to offer as a service. Now, do you have to charge more for that? Yes. You have to be careful about your pricing. But having that in-house means that you can do that development quickly. And certainly, other things that we did that were pretty major, we did creative development on different kinds of projects that were not necessarily the norm. And if you're working with different materials that are different than the usual, you know, polyester thread, 40 weight, and you know, stitch as usual or some poly twill applique, those things that are common to everyone most digitizers can handle. You start working with specialty threads, you start doing different kinds of uh, interpretation on the things you're working on. Let's say you do some home decor, you're doing spans of fabric, you're doing things that might not be normal from a commercial shop standpoint. But if you have somebody in-house, you can do testing, you can do creative development, and you can do that kind of work and perhaps bring yourself into alignment with a different profit center, a different market. So the creative input's a big deal. Uh, certainly the turnaround speed's a big deal. The last one is production. Um, if you have to try and get those efficiencies down or want to get your efficiencies down, so you're working on production specific routines that are for your particular, you know, the particular market you're in, let's say you are doing something that requires a lot of efficiency and you want to have somebody in-house to make changes quickly and to make changes specific to the way you want to run, or let's say you have a production method that's a little different than other people, or maybe you have a particular mix of uh, equipment that you're addressing that is not common to every shop, you'll either have to train up an outside digitizer or you may want an inside digitizer to work on that. The thing is, no matter how you do this stuff, when you bring somebody inside, either bring in a digitizer or train somebody up, you have to realize that you are committing their time to that and that you should be looking for ways that either you can make the digitizing itself a profit center or you can use it to either drive profit somewhere else, either bring things in as a marketing ploy, or have some other way that the digitizing enhances your offerings or allows you to address a market that you wouldn't without the digitizing. I mean, we're seeing people sell software and saying, hey, bring software in because you're saving money. Truthfully, when you look at, at the decent number of digitizers that are out there who are good and not charging a tremendous amount of money, especially when you have uh, you get a good partner who's working with overseas digitizers, it's hard for me to say, uh, yep, bring in bring it in house just to save money. I think that's the worst reason. Can it work? Can it be a thing? Sure, um, but then you have to work on either making a profit center or making it affect that bottom line for your business. Well, we're not all uh, embroidering for Breaking Bad and other television series, are we? Uh, uh, no, no, and that's the thing. Not every not every customer is going to be okay with you setting those kind of prices, and also not every customer is going to come in and need something in, in five in five hours, and, and gladly so. <laughs> it's it, usually what it means. That's here's the thing too. People say, "Why am I I'm charging a rush fee?" And what does that mean? What you have to realize is that it's not just because you have to rush. It's not just an inconvenience fee, though. Hey, I have no problem with charging those. Um, it's also because you're going to be sh ostensibly you have a full docket of things you have to do today and you're shoving those off and potentially having to run 
time and a half overtime or having to move customers around. There, there shouldn't be anything wrong with uh, charging for that when you need to do something that either inconveniences your customers or makes you run time and a half for your employees to stay after. <laughs> Yep. I mean, what the number one cost I was taught about in business school was opportunity cost. If you're not yeah. doing, if you're, if there's always a trade off with time and time is valuable. Um, and something you, you mentioned earlier is, uh, you know, what we see on screen doesn't mean it's what it's going to look like when it's sewn. And, you know, Deco Network, we have a awesome design tool in mm -hmm. which the customer can upload artwork. That doesn't mean it can be sewn. Um, I yeah, get a yeah. lot of customers, you know, not a lot, but some of them upload something that's simply, that's not going to fit on a hat. Yes, you yeah, can get an right. image of it on a hat. And yes, we could print it on a hat, but fine detail and, and um, y your customers have to have expectations set. Um, mm -hmm. and, and is why after a lot of the, you know, whenever we get a um, piece of artwork digitized, uh, we do a test so and send yeah. that an image to the customer to get their approval so that the expectations are set um, and they're getting what they want uh, with what is possible. Um, you know, sometimes with print, you get you can have crazy gradients and shading and stuff that just simply thread can't do uh, always. Now, some of it can be done, uh, <laughs> but yeah, it, it's it, again, digitizing is very much so an art. Um, something else to keep in mind when it comes to digitizing, when artwork is digitized, it is digitized for a specific size yes. and that size should not be expanded or shrank within, I'd say what, 5%. Is that, is that fair? <laughs> Here's the problem with it. To be honest with you, everybody's going to give you these rules of thumb and somebody will say, some people say 15%. Some people even go as far as 25. Uh, the truth of the matter is it's your smallest stitch and your largest stitch and the smallest gap or hole that you're trying to maintain. If you have a lowercase letter O that's done in satin stitch, which they generally are, um, you can't shrink it to a point where the hole in that O is any smaller than around a millimeter, 0.8 of a mil. If you do any smaller than that, it's either going to close up or tear an eyelet in your garment. Um, if we have lines of straight stitching next to each other, straight or running stitch next to each other, what we understand is when we have a fill stitch, all that is are lines of stitches packed closely together. Let's say instead we have an engraving style design that has a bunch of little detailed lines in it, something like you would see on you know engraving or like a, a dollar bill or something. If we, if we had little lines packed close to each other and they work well at a large size, we start to shrink those down. No software recalculates lines that are drawn like that. They don't recalculate them like a density. So when you shrink them down, they get closer together, and suddenly something that was from some shading is a solid line of something that looks more like a satin or a fill stitch. Um, when we are shrinking things, we are increasing the density of detail. If we have the original file or a software that does processing of density, then it might deal with things like a full density fill or full density satin stitch and and adjust for that. Not all software is doing that, depending on what you're using and what you're doing with it. And the same thing when we expand a design, we have to realize that any lines of straight stitching will still be the same thickness. So if we're doing something that has a lot of detail or, or small straight stitch outlines, as we expand it, those lines stay the same thickness, so they will look thinner in relation to the rest of the design, and the things will look more open. Plus, as we talked about with detail earlier, when we're working at a small size, we might reduce detail. We might draw fewer lines that are present. We might also not worry too much about uh, sharp corners, let's say, on a on something where we're drawing a, a line. We have to realize stitching always, where you're drawing a small curve in straight stitches, no matter what you do, a stitch is a straight line from point to point. So what it really is is like a little polygon. It has little corners. If we move that design into a larger space, we might end up finding all these errors or these places where we might have added more control nodes, drawn in the curve differently, and honestly made different choices about how dense the detail is that we could get, uh, how small our lettering can be, things like that. And as a general rule of thumb, we're mostly using 40 weight thread. That's the standard. People do use 60 weight. We can talk about how they, they can make things smaller. But with 40 weight thread, a safe letter, a safe letter that will run on most garments, most textures, is around 5 millimeters in height. Can they get smaller? Absolutely they can. But as we get smaller than that, we encounter more problems. You're going to find that that smallest letter, and that includes your lowercase, so the, the height of the lowercase letters, the smallest letter 
is going to be part of what keeps you from shrinking things down. And then once we get larger, let's say we have satin stitch lettering that has really wide satins in it, you're going to get to a point where first your machine will run really slowly as it double cycles through something that's really long over about 12 millimeters. And you'll also find that you have these longer, loopier, loftier stitches that if we're saying putting something on jacket back might be more likely to catch or fray or rip. So it's, it's all about the smallest stitch, the smallest gap, and the longest stitch that you have, and then looking at the level of detail. But ultimately, the best thing we can do if we have a digitizer digitize something, so they should be asking what size it's at, they should be respecting as best that they can the size that we request, and we should try not to expand it or contract it any more than we have to. That's really something where a digitizer is gonna have to make a different decision. And sometimes it's only a few percentage points, you're right, uh, before we might make a different decision. Well, like you said, negative space. A lot of customers want it. It's it's not print. It, you know, you have to set yeah. that expectation. And you know, some customers don't understand. Well, why do I have a digitizing fee for sewing the same logo on this polo versus a hat? And yeah. first of all, most times we sew on a hat versus a polo. The artwork is typically a different size, but really? there really are flats and there are hats. And a yes. hat is a round uh, object that must be rotated uh, yep. versus a flat product can be, um, obviously, it's a, it's a lot easier to sew. And what I think a lot of people don't even realize, when they go, when they buy a hat, a lot of the best embroidery I've seen, I know it's still possible, yeah. but it's actually sewn flat before the hat is fully constructed because you Absolutely. can do a lot of stuff. So when you see some of, the really cool, you know, Major League Baseball and stuff. I'm not saying it's not possible, but if you look sure. at most of the sports logos, there's not a whole lot of detail in there. It's a big C or, or, or something sure, very yeah. simple a lot of the times. Uh, but it is amazing what you can do when it comes to flat. And, and even when it comes to flats, Eric, um, you know, when you're sewing a duck cloth Carhartt jacket, it's a yeah. different digitizing strategy than the silk touch Polo, right? Absolutely. Absolutely it is. Um, invariably, we, like I said earlier, we're, we're driving a needle through a piece of fabric that's already there. And the characteristics of that fabric are going to cause things to happen to our needle and to our thread. We do things as we can to mitigate them. But like you said, if you're sewing on a super coarse woven material, let's say we have like a tote bag that has an even weave on it, you're going to find the edges of a lot of your satin stitches look kind of sawtoothed and rough. You can use some kinds of underlay like edge run underlays or you know those kind of contour underlays to help support that edge but ultimately the needle will deflect on something really coarse even sharp needles uh, you will have some wandering of the lines on things that are like that or let's say you have something that has a strong vertical grain like a knit hat if you don't use something like uh, targeted underlay stitching or some other method to hold things up out of that knit or smash flat the textures that we have there then you're going to find vertical lines are going to want to sink in, especially like vertical straight stitch lines will sink into the grain deeply. Uh, and you'll find that that texture can interfere with uh, small lettering and details and anything that kind of falls afoul of it. Because we're not, the problem is we're not thinking three-dimensionally. Most of the time people are thinking about embroidery as if it's something that's applied to the surface, but it's not. It's drawn through the fabric. The needle pierces the fabric, goes through it and the stabilizer and is drawn to tight under tension. And the construction of the fabric can affect that uh, to the point where the other thing that can happen, and it's a weird thing happens between digitizing and embroidery people don't notice, um, some fabrics, why do, we, why do we use stabilizer? To keep things dimensionally stable, stable. In any one direction, we don't want any more stretch than another direction. That's why we use a non-woven kind of wet laid stabilizer for a lot of stuff. Well, some fabrics will stretch more on the bias on 45 degree angles. And if you run your stitch angles at 45 degrees, you'll find that it stretches more or distorts more in that angle than if your stitch angle was a little bit uh, shallower. So it's stuff that you might not think about until you're on a machine operating and you watch the material deform. Uh, invariably, the thing is we have to think about these things holistically. You put together the digitizing, which is all the wonderful art interpretation, everything else, but that person who's digitizing has to understand the fabrics that it's going on, the construction of the garment, because once again with hats, it's both the method by which we hoop them. We have a cylindrical driver and that's fairly unstable, even with the best 
uh, you know, best intentions, the best setup, it's a fairly unstable thing. Uh, or the materials itself, when you have something that stretches or that has stretch in one dimension more than another. And then the kind of stabilizers we use and how much dimensional stability we get uh, involved in that, as well as how well our hoop is holding and arresting the fabric. So hence why the caps are so rough, you really don't have the kind of ability to arrest motion, arrest stretching the way you can with a hoop that's surrounding the entire area of your embroidery. So all of that comes together holistically to make this thing turn out. And invariably, if you if you don't have your machine set up correctly, let's say your tensions are off, you're not hooping correctly, you don't have the hoop tension correct, you don't have, you have where it's slipping in some angle or it's just not uh, holding fast in the hoop, or maybe you're on a cap frame and you don't have it clamped well or stabilized well, and if your design isn't really made for the kind of materials that you're working on, you're going to find that uh, you're, you'll get a lackluster result. But that's that's kind of the hard part, is that somebody who's digitizing needs to know a fair, a fair amount of that. They need to know enough of the execution side to understand both what the machine's going to do when they let it loose and what sorts of materials it's being used on so that they can adjust accordingly. Um, certainly, you can digitize toward kind of like a the best case scenario middle ground where it's like a, a garment with a little bit of texture and a little bit of stretch, and you get this about this density to get coverage on most colors. But usually when you do that, you're getting kind of heavier stitch counts, kind of a less flexible garment, less flexible decoration. And the better version is to know all of this stuff and go into it saying, I'm going to make a file that's going to make the best use of the materials that are there and you know work around those materials to some degree. And caps versus flats, if you haven't heard it before, I'll just say the old axiom, which is... Uh, on a cap, you want to work from the bottom up, center out. That's because the bottom dead center is kind of where the most stability is, where the brim of the cap is kind of locked in. And you work almost like a tablecloth. I call it the tablecloth method. You work out to one side, spreading out that loose material as you stitch it down to the stabilizer. And all of this is us trying to keep from, from building up ripples, keep from having excess motion, keep from having excess stretch in any direction and keep things in line long enough for all of you know, the outlines to register. So it's, like I said, it's a complex thing. It's not that you can't do it. And I would say this, people get a little cowed by all of this complexity, but it's something that with observation of the machines and testing and honestly watching your own designs run will become much more natural to any digitizer with some experience. Yep, and there's a reason we do test sews, and sometimes yes. you got to go back to your digitizer and say, hey, I need this changed a little bit, um, and if you're Absolutely. working with a good yeah. digitizer, they will um, sure. do that. I mean, it's a relationship. It's not, you know, you don't want it just to be quick and done, and something you just said, Eric, um, for those who don't know, when you're sewing a hat, it does start from the center and work its way out versus yeah. Yeah. when you're sewing on a flat. It, it's really what left to right in a way and still top to bottom. Um, there, there's a lot that goes into it. Something else you mentioned, Eric, just a minute sure. ago. So we have digitizing software and then there's other software. I don't even know what to really call it. Um, that allows us to uh, create kind of more finished proof or change file types. Um, one, you know, Wilcom is deeply embedded into Deco Network software. Mm -hmm. There's hundreds of Wilcom fonts. Um, one of my favorite pieces of software, and I don't know how many times they've renamed it and tweaked it, um, for $50 a year, you can uh, purchase Wilcom Workspace. And I really like um, just the basic stuff I can do. I can mm -hmm. um, really colorize it. I can change file formats. Um, so, you know, if you're not ready to take the plunge into purchasing the digitizing software for $50 a year, Wilcom Workspace will let you do, you know, some very minute things just to uh, help the customer visualize. And, you know, when Deco Network, they don't, we, we sew a DST file, but Deco Network software wants an EMB file. So if you ever wonder, well, why can't I get this DST in there? Wilcom Workspace will allow you to take that DST, turn it into a Wilcom or a Wilcom EMB file, and you can also create colorways um, because when you get a DST, it's not necessarily going to be the colors um, that that are going to be sewn. And um, especially with Deco Network, it, it's very much so uh, we import EMB, we export DST um, mm. to actually be sewn. Um, so. 
yeah, digitizing obviously is an art. You can do it in-house. You can outsource it. Um, but if you're just getting started, I think we both agree, outsource it. Um, bring it in-house when you need the extra flexibility and you have the demand and so forth because it's not going to just save you money. It's going to allow you to take things to the next level. And um, like you kind of said there, Eric, with digitizing, you could have the best digitizing ever, but you got to be able to stabilize the stitches. And yeah. stabilizing yeah. Um, comes down to using the correct backing uh, mm -hmm. itself. So, um, you know, if you go on to a, a website to purchase backing, it can get very overwhelming. There's all types of uh, you know, thicknesses of backing, you have solvent backing. Um, it, it does get a little complicated. It, it, do you have any suggestions as to, you know, how a shop could go about it? I mean, we have a ton of different backing here. I yeah. just know that we use two of each and we've even found that, okay, maybe we'll take some of the two and a half, but the first or last layer we'll use a different type. So, um, you know, what, what would you say, like, stabilizing and backing? What's the trick? Uh, the honest trick is, number one, that you do have to have a holistic view of things. Um, as we talked about with digitizing, I actually do things in my digitizing files to stabilize material, like running things like a global underlay, which is drawn manually. This is not an underlay setting, so it doesn't matter what software you're in. I'm, don't go looking for the global underlay setting. You won't find it. Um, I will draw things that help me to stitch down material before the design starts running. So part of that can help, especially with super shifty materials like performance wear and stuff like that. We talked about silk touch polos earlier, stuff like that. Um, the other thing is to honestly look at the manufacturer's recommendations if you don't know anything at all, because honestly, most of those recommendations have been tested and they're usually pretty close. They're usually right on the money to start. I also think most people use too much, uh, too much, stabilization. The thing is, we know that it's because there's a problem in this kind of holistic chain. If you aren't worrying enough about like excess densities and stuff, because when you build up excess density, it can actually cause rippling and puckering and things that look like problems with stability, because we're jamming so much material into a finished piece of uh, you know cloth that there's nowhere for it to go. So what does it do? It warps in three dimensions, because it, there's nowhere for that thread to go that you're jamming through like little wedges into your material. So lighter densities can help with that. But when we're selecting, we're selecting um, stabilizers. Most of the time, it's it's not that crazy. The thing is, people use them for different reasons, and often they're used as a band aid to help with either bad digitizing or that they're not hooping in a way that's uh, really secure. Sometimes they're using extra stabilizer to make that happen. Most of my work was done honestly. If you're on anything that stretches, most of what I was doing is with a medium cutaway. For most of my work, one piece of medium cutaway did a lot of the work for most of what we did. However, um, things that stretch unduly like performance wear, often I'm using a no-show mesh. If the no-show mesh isn't enough, a lot of people like to use woven backings. The thing I want to re remind everybody, and by the way, I usually call them stabilizers, not backings. Every once in a while I'll slip it, depending on what, who I'm talking to and what they say. <laughs> but I call them stabilizers because it's not just something that's behind the material. You have to remember what you're trying to do is arrest stretch, arrest motion in any given direction more than one uh, than the other direction. And the problem people have, they'll use a, a woven backing. It's something that looks like a loosely woven piece of cloth. They'll use one layer of it, and one layer almost never does the job on that particular backing because it has that 45 degree stretch I talked about. Because it's an even woven material, it doesn't stretch in the vertical, doesn't stretch in the horizontal, but it stretches on the 45. You need to take a second layer of it and turn it 45 degrees from the top layer and when you do that, then all of the angles that your stitches may be pulling on are covered. Oh, wow. So when you're using something that's a woven backing, other other backings that look like what people always say, they look like dryer sheets, by the way, don't use dryer sheets. Uh, <laughs> any, anytime you're using a wet laid material where it's not woven, it's just a bunch of fibers all in different directions, looks felty. Those ones are generally going to not stretch in any one given direction more than another. But the woven backings will, and so you most definitely need two layers. What gets to be a problem is where I see somebody where they haven't done their work in their digitizing or whoever's digitizing for them. They don't have deep enough overlaps, so their pull compensation isn't working for them. Their thing, like uh, satin stitches that are running edge to edge will pull apart as they get narrower naturally through the process. And rather than deeply overlap them, the person has either butted them right together, or used auto digitizing so it didn't really uh, take that into account or hasn't set enough of that overlap that's necessary 
uh, for it to not pull apart under stress. And so they have these outlines that are not running where they want them to. And the way they solve that is to throw more and more stabilizer on it until the material doesn't stretch or that doesn't move. Whereas that's not going to be comfortable for a person to wear. No one wants to wear the design that looks like a big piece of corrugated cardboards behind it. It feels bad, it looks bad, and it makes your embroidery look cheap and junky. Um, you want to have a lighter hand in your software. You want to get all of those uh, compensation points dealt with. You want to have enough overlap where it's necessary, whereas you don't want too much density where it's not necessary. And then you can use less stabilizer overall. But that's, that is also one of the reasons it's good to be either having a, a really tight relationship with the digitizer or sometimes digitizing in-house. If you have a high-end clientele that will not tolerate three, four, five pieces of, of stabilizer, then you need to adjust the rest of the process to get that right. Other than that, honestly, I'll be thoroughly patently honest. When something new comes out in the stabilizer world, I look at the manufacturers and see what they're recommending it for, and then I test it out. Nothing beats getting it on the machine, and in fact, one of the big failures that people have with digitizers when they're working with a digitizer that either has not or rarely gets on a machine, those folks may be talented even to the point of being talented in understanding how to interpret things into thread. But when it gets to that technical execution point where outlines start falling afoul of things where they, or you change materials and suddenly it doesn't work anymore, you were on a nice flat stable jacket, you throw it on a thick hoodie and now all the outlines are off and if they don't know how to make those alterations, that can be a problem. That's where you want somebody who's got embroidery experience to be a digitizer. And also where it makes sense for you as a as an embroidery operator or somebody who's running an embroidery shop, even if you're never gonna digitize a stitch in your life, to understand the terminology of digitizing and understand the normal stresses that are happening between the file and the machine will let you tell somebody, hey, over here in the bottom left, I've got an outline that's falling off of this fill. It doesn't look right. I need more pull compensation here. Being able to describe that to a digitizer means you're going to get an accurate fix much more quickly. I mean, certainly snap pictures, send those over, make sure they can see what's going on. And most of them are going to be able to, to diagnose that stuff. But if you know what's going wrong and you have watched your sequence, done your stitch out, you have a much higher chance of being able to communicate what's going on and what you need. And yeah, if you want to become more knowledgeable, read the Graphics Pro articles that well, Eric yeah. puts out each and I've month. Got, and, uh, you'll find me most of the time. Uh, I've got other ones. I really uh, don't always write for them every time. Used to write for Printware more. You'll find me in Images Magazine out in the UK too. And also I do a weekly uh, YouTube show. And a lot of those are, are based out of customer questions and uh, listener questions. So um, there are, and there's lots of people out there doing shows. There's lots of my good friends who are also doing education. But yeah, go to the trade shows, talk to people, and ask questions. A lot of us, you'd be surprised how long we spend answering questions. Those of us who are educating. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and and even in the Deco Network user group, you have yeah. thousands of uh, users of the software. A large portion of us, you know, have embroidery in house, and uh, yeah, it, it's a community. The whole um, industry as a whole. Uh, I, I, we never really look at each other as competition. Uh, there's the, we're in an industry that will, I mean, as long as people wear apparel, which I think is forever, uh, yeah, yeah. It, it's going to, it's going to thrive. Um, now when it comes to stabilizing, would you agree that, um, it really comes down to two things, one to help with the sewing and two to help with the washability because mm -hmm. just because it leaves the shop looking beautiful uh, doesn't mean that after a machine puts it through some serious you know abuse uh yeah. that stabilizer has got to be there and and um it, you know you talked about a cutaway versus the other type is a tear away mm -hmm. we always use a tear away on a hat versus a cutaway um on a polo or something else mm -hmm. um Correct me wrong. I mean, like a hat. First of all, you have that right on your skin. Not to say that a polo isn't that way as well, um, sure, sure. but you're not washing a hat really ever. Versus <laughs> a polo, you know, something like that. It's got to be able to be washed dozens of times. So, would you agree sure, that sure. Um, the stabilizer is really for both purposes? Yeah, and I think the thing is about knowing what will happen once that stabilizer is gone. Are there way, ways and reasons? There's always reasons to break the rules. I did a, a weekly show last week. My, my uh, Friday show was all about breaking kind of the rules, which are these rules of thumb for embroidery. 
Are there times where you aren't going to use stabilizer the same way? Absolutely. But for most designs, especially you have things where, the, where there are free floating elements, a logo is separated from the text, or there are multiple elements in the logo or the logo type that are uh, not connected, you're going to find that if you then put that on a human body, especially if it's fitting in any kind of tight way on something that's stretchy, it will look crooked, things will fall apart, and if the integrity of that logo is important, which it almost always is, you need the stabilizer to be there, if nothing else, forget washing, just to be able to keep the logo together. Uh, knit hats is a big one. People want to do, out, do without any stabilization on, on knit hats. Uh, sometimes you can use something like a knockdown stitch like we have for Imbrilliance, or uh, I always taught a light mesh fill that is just a, a way of making that kind of stitch for uh, different softwares. Um, you can have something where the stitching holds it all together with a kind of a general area of stitching underneath, like a light fill underneath the, the decoration. But otherwise, if you have loose lettering, let's say on a knit hat, it looks nice when you're done stitching. You stretch it over someone's head and suddenly the letters are tilting or spread apart or look terrible. Stabilizer will hold those together. And when you're talking about washing, admittedly, there are issues with washing. Um, sometimes when you're washing stuff, it doesn't always look as good as when it first comes out. Lots of people recommend pressing. The other thing I'll say is always, if you can, if you're putting in materials with your garments, it's great to make sure you put washing instructions. If you have something that requires any sort of special washing, put the washing instructions in. It's also a great place for you to do one little bit, last bit of marketing when you deliver your product is to have your branding on that or something else. But washing instructions, especially for any kind of specialty materials, or um, let's say you use rayon thread rather than polyester. Polyester kind of became the de facto standard because it'll hold up to industrial laundry and, and chlorine bleach, whereas rayon will not, it'll bleed and doesn't hold up to that laundry the same way. Uh, you need to know that stuff and your customer needs to know that stuff. And ask me how I know with this many <laughs> this many years of embroidery, I, I actually had, I, I will recount one of the times this happened to me, one of my operators decided uh, to use any of the thread that was red in the right color for a medical order. So these were all lab coats for docs, lab coats and scrubs. And they were mixing rayon and poly thread and a good you know 25% of them came back bleeding all over the white coats because the rayon thread was being subjected to industrial laundry. You have to know that stuff and you have to share that with folks. Um, but yeah, stabilizer, it's there for a reason. The best thing you can do if you have to have stabilizer that stays around, um, use less, don't use stacks and stacks of it, get your hoop tension right, get your digitizing right, and make sure you're using you know all the tools you can to kind of lighten that stuff up, you make sure your thread tensions are right. And use the proper kinds of stabilizer. If you have a super uh, lightweight garment, Start with no-show mesh types of stabilizer, lighter performance-based stabilizers instead of going straight to the heavy cutaway just because it keeps uh, problems from happening with your embroidery. Yep, and, and like Eric said, um, when, you're, when you're looking for um, what backing to use, the backing stabilizer will come down to the artwork itself and the product itself. Uh, yeah. Both yeah. kind of have to come together. Um, and it, like you said, it's got you got to test, uh, and mm -hmm. and over time, uh, it gets easier. What I always suggest, whether it's print or embroidery, find old apparel that yeah. you're no longer wearing, and test and wash and uh, practice makes perfect. Um, but but great digitizing and then using the lack of or the wrong stabilizer isn't mm -hmm. going to get you the best results. Um, they they go hand in hand. Um, uh, but on top of backing, you know, what? how do we get the backing to stay with the garment? Well, that comes down to hooping. And yeah. hooping, um, when it comes to hooping, you really have flats and you have hats. Um, and yep, then you've yep. got the crazier uh, stuff like, gosh, we did bucket hats a couple weeks ago. And yep, oh yep. my, was that the most difficult thing ever to hoop. <laughs> And they do have jigs that are specifically for that type of product if you're ready True. to drop $500 on it because the hooping, I mean, it's it's not cheap stuff, but one of the things I can't recommend highly enough are using some type of magnetic hoop. Yeah. Uh, magnetic yeah. hoops will really allow you to do a couple different things. One, it allow you to get uh, a great tension of the material. 
Um, and secondly, it allows you to nail that logo placement uh, really yeah, well. Yeah, typically, yeah. they come with the jig, and you want to make sure that the the sizes uh, get the right left chest placement because, let's be honest, in embroidery, if, if you're going on a hat, um, obviously, you can go on the front, the sides, the back. Um, and a lot of machines nowadays, you know, they'll have a 270-degree uh, sew area, sometimes even more, and that'll allow you to get on the front and the sides, but um, embroidering, you know, on the above a loop of an adjustable hat. I mean, that's yeah, not yeah. always the easiest thing. But when we're sewing flats, um, typically, I mean, the majority of the time, at least for our shop, it's left or right chest, left chest yeah. the majority of the time. And then you can obviously go on sleeves and over time, the locker tag, uh, back yeah, neck yoke. yoke area, it's got a 10 different names. Um, and then you get someone like the North Face who <laughs> makes the you know, back right the shoulder. shoulder. Yeah. Like it's yeah, amazing. Cool. Um, but but hooping, again, it goes back down to great digitizing. You're using the right stabilizer. But mm. then your placement or your uh, material isn't the right, you know, tautness. It, yeah. It's not going to deliver the best result. So um, – other than, you know, getting a magnetic hoop and doing some practicing, what else do you suggest uh, as far as hooping? Well, I, I would certainly like to second the use of hooping jigs. One of the best things you can be in in any sort of decoration, so whatever you're doing as a decoration company, one of the best things you can be is consistent. And being able to spot on target the same area the same left chase placement every time uh, as you did in previous orders or to make uh, finite adjustments to that stuff a hooping jib makes a big difference to that so you don't have to have a magnetic hoop to use them hooping boards and hooping jigs that have those adjustable p pins and positions are fantastic but magnetic hoops are great uh, because they do the one thing hoops are meant to do which is maintain tension all around the outside edge it's also why honestly if you're not using a magnetic hoop uh, rectangular hoops can be tr troublesome and problematic, and a lot of the folks in the kind of the crossover home embroidery space know because they often have rectangular hoops to try and maximize their uh, kind of uh, addressable area in the hoop. The sides of, of rectangular hoops can be looser than the corners. The only points of real tension are in the corners, and so the, the sides will slip both in you know, a horizontal and vertical in the hoop. So on X and Y axis, you have these areas where the material is easily slipping, and so people are doing things like using clamps and other things to hold them together. Whereas on a magnetic hoop, you've got several points of tension everywhere. There's one of those rare earth magnets. You've got a point of tension that's holding your stack, your sandwich of stabilizer and material together. And it's all around the hoop in an, in an even kind of grid, right? Because of that, that means in any direction you might be pulling or pushing with your stitching, you're going to have something arresting the rest of that motion. So that's something to think about. Magnetic hoops are great because they give you even tension all the way around. And in fact, you'll find some people who don't like hooping or are worried about things like hoop burn who try and pin or baste or stick everything down. And honestly, I can't recommend enough that you just hoop. At commercial world, most of the time, that's fine. People who are coming from other uh, craft or art markets might find that they, they have gotten used to doing basting and, and other sorts of things. But in a commercial machine, running at speed, having everything hooped is the right way to go. What I will say is, folks, that uh, screw is there for a reason. Adjust your hoop tension depending on the stack of stabilization material you're using. Uh, I've seen people who have problems, and I, I've talked to them about it, and it's like they tighten it down, it's real loose, but that's it. Um, make sure the hoop ring, if you're using a traditional type of hoop, is tensioned correctly so that you're actually getting it tight. The other thing is, if you have something that stretches, uh, don't overstretch it to try and make it arrest the motion. If you just absolutely stretch something to its ultimate capacity and then smash that hoop down as tight as you can, drum tight, then you're going to stitch something in the middle and all the fabric that's underneath what you've stitched is stuck in that stretched kind of state because it, it's now stitched down in that format. It's sewn to a piece of stabilizer that doesn't want to move. Then when you unhoop it, the rebound of all that material trying to stretch back into its original condition is going to pile around that design and make ripples and issues and folds and look terrible Pucker. so a lot of ripples and puckle puckers are all about overstretching that garment too so you want to lay it down firmly in the hoop have it nice and smooth so no wrinkles no problems but then when we're pressing that in and we're getting it firmly hooped yes you want it tight you don't want it to move too much but you also definitely don't want to grab your you know your silk touch polo and stretch it out to the limits or your knit hat and stretch it to the limits and then smash it down because you're going to end up with a rebound that makes it look worse 
Um, but yeah, that's the thing. Is like get get good hoops, and that's great if you can get magnetics. It's fantastic. If you're going to be doing cat backs forever, like that's a thing that you want to do. You'll be going to do it day in and day out. Save up and get a cat back clamp that's made for it because it does make your life easier. Otherwise, there you can certainly still do them in other fashions. You can do them on a traditional cap hoop. You can even put them in a flat hoop, depending on how tight you're uh, running to that kind of keyhole in the back. But invariably, if you're doing something that's a specialty item that you're going to be doing forever, it's a signature of your company, think about speeding things up with jigs or with those specific clamps or other sorts of uh, fixtures. Yes, they're expensive. If that's your bread and butter, you have to think about the thousands of pieces it'll take to do it. Now, if it's not your bread and butter, hey, that's fine. Do what you have to do, hoop something flat, stretch it, <laughs> clamp it down, whatever you need to. Uh, we've all done those jobs. But if there's something that you're going to be doing consistently and you want to do that product or you're making it a profit center, then by all means, look at those specialty jigs because there's stuff available now that just wasn't available when I came into the industry that could make your life a lot easier. Yep, and and one thing that Deco has uh, recently um, released is they actually have a map of mm. the, the United States and uh, other decoration shops using the software can register themselves, hey, you can outsource orders to me. So not everybody likes to tell their customer no, although it, the best thing I can suggest is, you know, not every job is meant for you, but True. you can often take on a job and just outsource it to somebody who specializes it. And when you build up the demand, bring it in house. It's just yeah. like that for anything in the decoration industry. Um, somebody else will do it typically at a contract rate and you establish that relationship. Like I, I won't go near the back of a hat, but I only get it <laughs> demanded. Like, you know, I'll get 80 fronts before I'll yeah. get a back and I'll sure. just pass it on to somebody else. And as long as I break even, I'm happy. Um, so, you know, don't sure. be afraid to outsource uh, once you find somebody good. And um, you mentioned, um, you know, if you're using a traditional hoop, uh, making sure that back screw is is tight. Um, what we've learned when it comes to hats is, you know, you do a dad hat that's real flimsy, cotton unstructured versus a really mm -hmm. structured new era hat. They are you. You really need to kind of change the um, the ring uh, width, mm -hmm. and and it's just untightening the screw, tighten it back up. Um, it's just the little things. It takes 10 seconds and you're going to get a better result. Um, something else you mentioned about uh, hooping is there's there's a lot of different hoop sizes and yeah. th there's not necessarily yeah. one fits all. You don't want to use a hoop that is too, you know, maybe your artwork is small, but then you have this big hoop. You want good tension, which yeah. revolves around using the right size hoop and, and um it, it might end up leading to having half a dozen uh, of different size hoops. Um, but it is very important to use the correct size. And um, some locations, it's it's difficult. You know, I, I love magnetic hoops, but getting inside the sleeve with a magnetic hoop, it's, it's almost impossible because there's a real thick area around it. So, um, we, we, yeah, so it's uh, – hoops can be expensive – uh, jigs can be expensive, but it drastically reduces the mistakes, in my opinion. I mean, most of the time we're selling something. It's not a two and a half dollar T-shirt. Uh, the average polo is around ten dollars plus. I mean, if I'm going on a thirty dollar Nike polo, I want to make sure I'm nailing that location, tension and everything. And I uh, cannot speak highly enough about, um, you know, buying uh uh, jigs, first of all, um, having a range of hoop sizes, and if you can afford it, go the magnetic route, in my opinion. It, it will yeah. drastically uh, make some stuff easier. It allow you to bring on somebody new and get them to successfully hoop in a short amount of time versus, you know, having a screwdriver and, and screwing it and uh, trying to nail that left chest location because, it's amazing. I watch a lot of commercials and sports games. The, the one that kills me the most is watching a football game and the coach has a left chest uh, logo. And I'll see it all over the place, Eric. I'll see it too high, <laughs> too low. And uh, you, yeah, it, it's amazing. But those jigs will really allow you to uh, be consistent about it. 
Um, well, and here's here's another thing that's just a funny funny thing to say, but it's something that I have experience with. Being a larger person, I just want to recommend to everybody to make sure that you are centering those logos off of the collar. If you go from the center seam to the seam in the, under the armpit and measure halfway across and drop a logo there, it will go around the side of someone's body <laughs> into their armpit. Um, it looks great when it's flat, and that's what some people, when they first start out and they're hooping flat on a table, they don't really know this stuff, they'll align way too far out toward the sleeve. Really, you're looking to be centered on the edge of the collar. And it's something that kind of people will argue about how far or how far down or what have you. And that's something you can adjust and honestly always show a customer a mock up or lay out either the stitch out or a print up and snap a picture with the ability for us to text pictures back and forth immediately these days. If you're in doubt of something, snap a picture and show the customer where it's going to be. Uh, but yeah. Seriously, don't lay out a big garment, especially if you have all different sizes going from, you know, from junior sizes up to 3X. They're not all going to be the same and certainly don't take a large a large size and just go run straight into that half point between the two seams. You'll always be wrong. <laughs> but that's, that's the joy of using these jigs. They often also come with guides that have nice general ideas about where things should be. And the guides tend to... Uh, both the guides and the uh, jigs themselves will tend to help you figure out how to use the seams that are on the shirt to align the entire thing so you get straight to. Um, yes, there are always manufacturing errors that can happen and pockets can be a whole bu a barrel of fun with how straight the pocket itself is. But uh, <laughs> you will have a better time with a jig, if, especially if you're somebody who's just starting out or let's say, at, like we talked about kind of earlier, you're a printer moving into embroidery. Um, a, a jig, a, a hooping assistant of some kind is going to be really helpful for you. Yeah, and and again, time is money and mistakes yep. are costly. And if those jigs can cut down on those two, they will pay for themselves fairly oh. quickly. And if you're using job management like Deco, you can put somewhere in the notes what setting you used for that hoop system. And the next time the customer comes back, that logo is in the same place every time. That yep. is, shop management software makes you look like a hero because you'll remember what happened on that last garment. And no, no, no matter what digitizing software you're using, no matter what other software you're using, I, I often use more than one software to get in. You guys know I work for a different software company as well, but I've worked, I've used multiple softwares throughout my career. You can get things into the system. You can make that happen. So don't let that kind of uh, cow you. As, as we were talking about earlier, there's ways to translate stuff. There's ways to make it work and you don't necessarily have to retool your whole shop to get involved with, you know, shop management. All right. So, um, again, it all starts with digitizing soft, uh, <laughs> digitizing the artwork. Sure, then sure. you need to select the right stabilizer. You hoop the garment. Now we're ready to actually sew it on the machine. And yeah. when it comes to sewing on the machine, again, you could get all three of those perfect. But if the machine is, the tension is off on the thread, sure. or um, the, the other big one is it's, it's sewing too quickly. Um, I just recently bought a new machine and they bragged about, hey, you can sew it this fast. Just because I can doesn't mean I should. Um, so what are your tips as far as, you know, actual machine, uh, settings so that you're getting the best results? I mean, are those two of the most important because it, again, you could have the other three, right. But if, if the tension or speed is off, you're not going to get the best results, right? Yeah. Thread tension is pretty big because you'll get looping. You'll get other problems there. Also making sure you're using the right needle for the right thread in the right circumstance. Um, I will admit that in a lot of my commercial uh, work, I used kind of a 7511 needle with a medium ball. So something that I, and honestly, I would even use that sometimes where you should have had a sharp and it'll handle okay. But you're going to find that if you're being specific with your needle choice, you're probably going to get a slightly better, a slightly cleaner outcome. And definitely if you want to do stuff like move into 60 weight thread where you can do smaller lettering, smaller detail, it's a finer thread, then you need to go down to that smaller needle that goes with that. And then be aware of what kind of forces can be on that needle when you're running it. Uh, so those things are all important. Getting that machine set up is important. Uh, when you're talking about speed, I don't like to just give somebody a speed because like right now I'm running this wonderful ZSK single head that, that I, I love. 
And this machine runs incredibly fast, incredibly smooth. I know that if I ran back to some of the old machines that I was running commercially before I was you know, doing testing and software development stuff, if I went back to one of those commercial machines and admittedly a little older, definitely a little more worn out, something that's been used for some time and, and you know, <laughs> put through its paces and tried to run it at the same speeds, I'm not going to get that smooth as glass execution as I get out of this very highly engineered you know, single head machine. And the thing is, not all machines are going to be able to run at all speeds. Not all material combinations are going to be able to run at all speeds safely. I would say ramp up and find out where you've got that happy medium and realize that you can kind of compensate for all of that in software. You can kind of compensate for it at any stage of the game. You're running faster. You might have to increase pull, pull and push compensation to some degree. But there's a, an upper limit where you get to a point that there's just no time for the stitch to relax in place, for the tension to come off of each individual stitch between the, you know, between penetrations, or you're working on a kind of material that heats up or tends to gum up as you're running through it, you can have issues where you are just happier at a slower speed. Though I will say sometimes it gets used as a band-aid where people are slowing down way below normal production speeds to get something to run where they really should have increased their pull or push compensation or they should have moved something in the software. So it, once again, it's all holistic, which sounds super complicated. What it does mean, though, is that uh, at, we can at least say as we increase speed, we're going to increase tension to some degree and we're going to um, make it more possible for things to kind of fall apart. So running at kind of a medium pace, not full bore toward the top end of what your machine can do is probably the call for a lot of garments and especially garments that stretch a, a lot or that aren't particularly stable. The faster we run, the more likely we're going to run into them kind of pulling out of place or having things out of alignment, out of registration. Um, other real big things is just making sure that your machine is good in good operating order. Lots of people want to get into the embroidery business for the absolute lowest amount that they can. And what they end up doing is they want to do all the work themselves because they believe they're going to save money by doing all the digitizing. They want used equipment uh, and they're trying to get equipment from, you know, auctions or from somebody's closed shop out of a garage that's been sitting, laying there for a while, not being maintained. They put all these things together and then they start embroidering and have a lot of really poor results. And it's hard for them to target what's going on. They're learning digitizing at the same time that they're running a machine that they don't really know that hasn't been seen by you know, a tech in any time recently and may or may not be running that well. And they're doing this while learning new materials. And often they're doing their testing on something cheap because they don't want to spend on testing materials. So what do they end up doing? They test on stabilizer. Um, all of these <laughs> things put together mean that you can't really tell what's going to happen on the machine. You can't really know what part of it's the problem. Uh, certainly I'll, I'll stop and say real quick, like I heard a little laugh there. I know you feel like I feel about this with uh, testing. Um, when you're testing any design, even if your machine's in perfect condition, even if everything else is right, when you're testing a design, if you don't test on a very close analog to the material you're going to use with the stabilizer yep. you're going to use, you will not know how something's going to turn out. It's just like any kind of science. You don't want to change more than one variable at a time. And in this case, the variable is whatever's going on with the file. You're testing the file, you need it to be on the at least very close to the same material as the garment you're going to use with the same stabilizer you're going to use. And if you can, at least the same level of contrast with the color. It, you, that's the one where you might give more, but the rest of it, you really need to be close together. Now, buy it from a thrift store if you have to. Whatever it takes to get that material is fine. You don't necessarily have to have the same garment or buy extras, though some of us do. Um, but you do want to test as close as you can to the actual produce. And then when it comes to the setting up of the machine, the machine needs to be clean. The thread path has to be clean. The tensions have to be correct. And I would very much recommend getting a tension gauge. Uh, your bobbin, especially if the bobbin spring is dirty, it's going to loosen the tension on the bobbin. And much of the trouble you're going to have in tension is not going to be top tension. Most of the time when everything's going wrong, it's going to be on the bobbin. One way to find that out is if it's happening on every top needle, then there's a good likelihood bobbin is the culprit for that stuff. You're getting looping toward the top. But no matter what you do, I would say it's worth investing in a tension gauge. If nothing else, you want to run either what they'll call an H test or a Fox test is the one I often use because it has stitches in all different angles that'll show you how much bobbin you have on the back and how much top thread and you want to adjust appropriately. The great thing is, just like I said earlier with the stabilizers, if you go to whatever machine or whatever thread manufacturer you use and you look at the thread, they will generally tell you what tension that thread should run at. They'll tell you the needle that they recommend for that thread, uh, often also the needle they recommend for the substrate, so whatever material you're working through. And you, if you get yourself a tension gauge for the top and a tension gauge for the bobbin, you'll be able to set that up. 
are you going to tension everything with gauges every single time? No. But when you're initially setting a machine up or if you're starting to diagnose a problem, it's going to be very helpful to you to be able to actually test that and be able to quantify what's going on. So like, like I said, it's, it's a lot of things that come together, but uh, <laughs> certainly there are ways to isolate it. In fact, I think this is the best way to kind of put it. We're trying to isolate what's happening. Best thing we can do is make sure our test bed is good. So machine is all oiled up and, and ready to go in the right condition. All the thread flats clean, everything's clean on the machine. So we don't have anything complicating where the threads running through. It, but then when we start to run things, we should check out where things are happening in the design and how they're happening. If you have something like a thread break or something that's happening in the very same spot on a design more than once, it keeps happening in the same spot, then we probably have some interactions going on with the file. The file has something going on, too many short stitches, a tie where it shouldn't be or should, you know, or is missing. Something is going on in the area where we're having that thread break all the time. Or where we're having too much density because we packed in too many layers of density all in the same place. Then we know that's a file thing because it's happening at the same location every time. It's very likely to be part of the file. If it's not happening at the same location every time, we're having random thread breaks throughout the design, then we start looking at things like the thread path. We start looking at things like scoring on our needle plates, scoring on you know the bobbin case, stuff like that. We're seeing random looping intention. We want to see, is the bobbin case out of round or is, the, is it dirty? Clean the bobbin case, run again. We're still having it catch up once in a while. Uh, then we want to look and see, is it, like I said, is the bobbin case out around? Is it catching? Is there something going on up in the thread tree? Is there something going on that's not letting the thread pass smoothly? And then we look at things like if we have looping and problems like that. We also want to look at tensions and make sure they're running right. Or if we're getting bobbin thread coming up to the top, then I, but like I said, most of that trouble is going to come out of the bobbin first. A lot of it is dirty bobbins or bobbins that are out around, or honestly, sometimes you just need to swap the bobbin out. Every once in a good while, you'll have a dud that just doesn't spool off the way it should and just swap it out because it's a lot cheaper than ruining the garment. <laughs> yep. <laughs> but you just isolate it. If it's on one needle, then the other thing is you're having a problem that's happening on one needle. Switch to another needle with the same file at the same space. If it's happening on all the needles, then we know it's probably not just that one needle. It's, it's how you isolate. You just work through the problems piece at a time and say, all right, can I isolate it to the area? And what kind of normal things can I check out as far as upkeep and making sure everything's just ready to roll. Yeah, that goes back to the, the days of the scientific method. You know, mm -hmm. we use it every day in our shop. You know, you first oh, identify yeah. a problem, you come up with a hypothesis, and you yep. test one variable at a time to, yep. to get it nailed down. Um, and, That's the way. you know, a couple different things you said there that, that I couldn't agree with more is, one, you, you need to be test sewing yeah. as close to the material as possible, and if optimally the closest color, thrift store yeah. is a great place to go get some sure. uh, stuff and then i'll tell you we we've, we've got some shirts in here it probably has 30 different logos it looks like a nascar <laughs> shirt but it's yeah it, you know we're a hoarder um and and if you do screw up a garment and it's beyond repair that becomes a test uh product yep. so uh you're yep. definitely uh right about that um the main maintenance with the machine is keeping it looped you know, yep. you, you need to be dropping oil on it. That's our daily maintenance. It's very minute. It's not like flushing a DTG printer uh, <laughs> and no. whatnot. It's really not that hard. And then a lot of these machines, after a few thousand hours of sewing, you really do want to spend a couple hundred bucks, have a tech go through it and, and take it to the next level. Um, and most of the machines, at least the ones I've bought, a little message will pop up. Hey, this thing is due for maintenance. And it's like a car. If you just ignore the oil change, you're not going to help it. You really want to make sure that that you're you're taking care of your piece of equipment. Um, and like you said, you get what you pay for. It's kind of funny. You mentioned a single head ZSK. That's what I just got. And mm. it is a beast. Um, when are, it comes to a, a machine, uh, I always say I like Japanese, German, and American engineering because <laughs> they take the time to to do it right. And that ZSK is a heck of a German-made product. Um, yep. And, yet, you know, one thing I love about the ZSK that turned me on is if I – if I wanted to upgrade the machine, I have an entire year to do so, and they charge me the difference between mm. the product I bought and the other machine, which gave me a lot of peace of mind. 
And um, a mistake I often see with a lot of shops is they think bigger is better. You know, oh, I need a four or six head machine. I'm like, I'd rather have multiple single heads. It all comes down to what your customers are asking for. You know, if I'm doing yeah. a bunch of 100 plus piece jobs, yeah, I don't want a single head machine. But my average job is 12 to 24 pieces. A single mm -hmm. or a two head is going to be so much easier. Um, and something I, you know, I, I often thought the amount of needles on a machine comes down to just how many colors do I want to allow to be sewn? And we talk about testing and so forth. You know, our first five, six colors are what we use more than anything else. Black, white, red, a, a common gray. And we never take those off. But having yep. 18 needles, for example, it will allow you to do a lot of test sewing without having to, to change. And every time you change that thread, that, that's where your tension can often yep. get thrown off a bit. And tension, like, like Eric said, it comes down to what's going on at the top and inside where you have the bobbin um we I, I at least i always would suggest you get magnetic bobbins it, it's they they work really well at least in my, in my opinion but um it, it is amazing you don't think that the tension could change but it does <laughs> and um sometimes that bobbin is down to the last 10 percent. and if i'm running problems just chuck it it it, it that's where I, at least we have our problems um but you know when you're selecting a machine uh don't think that bigger is better uh definitely maintain it and more needles will often make those test sews and just changing certain thread colors uh for certain jobs just much easier because you're not taking off um all of the needles all the time and mm -hmm. um yeah it, it's again it, when you're selecting equipment think about what size your orders are and, and Eric, I, I think you agree you should always have a single head. It, it's never a bad I idea. Think so. to have one. Uh, I think so. Every time I see somebody who's trading in their single, they're trying to trade in their single to get a multi-head machine. I always feel like they're making a mistake uh, because invariably in every shop I've been, unless you are just doing large, like you said, large contract orders only, um, the necessity of having a single head machine, both for testing and personalization, it's always there. And it just makes you a little more uh, resistant to being disrupted. If you need to make one piece out of, out of the blue to finish up an order, to fix something went wrong, to add a piece to a previous order, having an open single will always make that easier than having to break down a machine. Also, we often have to personalization. Uh, embroidery, as we know it, really started with dropping names on things, uh, names and monograms and things like that. And those are going to be individual usually to the piece. It's not it's not that common that we're running a multi-head order with names of the, the same name on it. Yeah, we can switch heads on and off, but when we're doing a couple pieces of personalization on an order that is otherwise, you know, standard logo stuff, great to be able to throw that on the single. And often also great to be able to have one machine on hats, one machine on flats when we can. So yeah. I, I like the versatility of having mul multiple smaller machines for most shops these days who are doing small run orders. Uh, big contract shops, yeah. And the shops I worked for, I worked on, my first job was running two 12 heads. So it's not that I have, I definitely don't have any anti-multi-head bias, love running multi-heads, but I do know that we had lots of orders where we had, you know, 26 pieces. And at the end of that order, you know, depending on, on how things were set up, I've got multiple heads that are sitting there with the, uh, the head switched off and the take-up lever still running that are you know tearing up at that length of thread that's on there and not stitching anything because the order doesn't fill those heads kind of the right way and sometimes the other thing is we would be doing a lot of personalization individual stuff and we were you know turning heads on and off all the time and it meant that we were running one piece at a time on a 12 head machine while the rest of the heads were, were laying there um not going to be the case for every market but depending on the market you're in especially you're doing high personalization boutique work gift work a fleet of singles is going to do you probably a better, uh, you know, a better turn than having bunches of multi-head machines. It really just depends on the kind of work you're doing. Commercial business to business work, uniforming stuff like that. Uh, having a multi is going to be great as you get into more, uh, as you get into more quantity per order. But ultimately, I think that having the versatility of having a single head is something that you shouldn't give away lightly at the very least. Maybe not everybody is running in to do a fleet of several singles, but at the same time having a single head on especially when you're doing things like testing your designs regularly you may just use it as your main testing machine and to kind of second the whole thing about needle count 
Uh, I, I really started my career first on six and then spent a lot of time on nine needle machines. So this is back in the old days, right? This is time when we were using far fewer colors to execute things, certainly. But the, the big thing is not that logos have that many more colors these days. Yes, maybe they might, but that's not the thing that made them versatile. Like you said, not only keeping your stock colors on, but with the advent of 60 weight thread being more common to get finer text, to get smaller than that five millimeter, you can go down to four and less very readily. With wanting to do fine detail and small and small work with 60 weight thread, we'll keep a couple needles uh, uh, with the 65 nine needles at all times, usually with the black and white 60 weight thread. And it means we can do fine lettering work while we do the rest of the work in the 40 so we don't increase our stitch counts. So we can do all the rest of the fills and colors and everything else in 40 weight thread as usual, and then drop fine text and keep needles one and two on 60 weight all the time. Um, meaning they're tensioned correctly for the 60 weight and they have the proper needles on board. Um, it's another way that you can utilize more needles that's not just allowing someone to have 18 colors on a design. And honestly, most designs aren't going to have it. And on, I really don't recommend most of that work <laughs> unless you're charging enough for it. Um, people don't think about it, but uh, the color changes are the times you're going to have the most trouble on your machine. If you're going to have thread pull out, if you're going to have stoppages, it's almost always as a color change and trim is more likely than anything else. Plus trimming takes the most time. If you can run connecting stitches under a later piece of embroidery in your design, it's always better than jumping and trimming if you can hide those connectors because it's always faster. Slowing down to tie off and trim and cut and move is always slower than the same number of stitches to travel that space, always. And like I said, if you're gonna cut, if you're gonna trim, if you're gonna jump, that's the most likelihood you have of a work stoppage. Um, it's just the best thing you can do to reduce the amount of color changes in your design, or and that can also be just sorting them correctly using a color sort or looking at your sequencing to make it work the best you can. But also, literally, if you can avoid jumping, if you can run part of that design or run some tiny, uh, you know, straight stitches between two pieces and hide them under something else, you can use traveling stitches, as we call them. That's always going to be a better aim than trimming. And also, like I said, when, when we have all of our colors set up, and I'll say uh, we did a very similar thing, and I always kind of recommend a very similar thing to have that kind of base set of colors. Uh, you can do a lot of your work without changing them. Uh, for us, not only do we have kind of the black, white, and what have you, the thing I always tell people is that your local school and things like your state flag colors will often be part of that basic set. At least in New Mexico, we have this very bold gold and red flag that everybody references. A lot of the designs have the Zia symbol from that flag in them. And in, in, invariably, most of the businesses have something with a Zia symbol on it at some point. Uh, you will be doing a lot of red and gold. So knowing that, or knowing that, let's say the high school you serve the most or the college that's in your town, has you know let's say red and silver as their top colors they might be good ones to have on the machine all the time if you're doing a lot of that work but yeah same thing more, more needles is great to have it doesn't mean you can't do it with them without them but you have to understand that it you know it can be a tool that's not just for adding complexity it can be for reducing the amount of uh, downtime yeah those the, the you just nailed two of the things i i couldn't agree with more but just that when i was just getting started with it and I was looking for a machine years ago um, I over I looked at needle quantity more based on the amount of colors we typically sell I mean most of the jobs we do is really one to four a lot yeah. maybe some four to ten but rarely am I ever getting anything over ten and yeah. the second yeah. thing that that you mentioned there was um, often we're, we're, we're kind of told um, the larger the design the more along it takes to sew because it's obviously more stitches mm -hmm. not just that uh the more colors in the design the more yeah. uh cuts and trimming and that takes time and secondly detail you know yeah. two two you could have two different designs same amount of stitches one's going to take a lot longer than the other just because of the amount of colors and detail in it so yeah. it, there's not a perfect uh formula when you're quoting a customer always of the, the turnaround time, although I do know there's software out there that, that does make it a little bit more accurate. Um, but last, last thing I'll kind of point out there, if you're using Deco software, uh, we estimate stitches based on the size of the artwork 
and we can set the stitch density. So, you know, the, the default is a thousand stitches per square inch. And if you think you're underestimating a lot of jobs, increase that density. So when the artwork comes in, you're actually uh, accounting for even more stitches or, or that more detail and color changes. And secondly, um, you know, Eric said, we, we do exactly what he said. We have one machine for hats, one machine for flats, and it's not a bad idea to have two different price tables, one for flats, one for hats, because hats are often sewn at a slower speed um, when they're round. Um, so it, some shops actually like to have a totally different table for uh, sewing onto a hat than a flat because of the machine speed um, that it has to sew at. Um, comes down to what equipment you're using. I just bought um, a ZSK. It sews hats much quicker than than my original machine, so it, I, we've really cut it down to the point that we've not only for having a second machine, it, it's doubled our speed, but it's almost tripled it in a way because we can sew hats much quicker than than we ever had. Um, the one thing I'll say about hats is huh, six panels, not always the most fun. Some of those panels are really thick. Um, and we have learned that when we push someone towards that five panel, we're able to hold a lot more detail uh, depending on their design. Um, but um, so to summarize everything, um, and, and obviously it's more than just these four pillars, but it all starts with digitizing. It, it doesn't matter how, what equipment you have, what backing, how you hoop it. If the digitizing isn't good, it's not going to work well. Uh, yep. You must select the right stabilizer backing. Um, you know, don't there's as Eric said, you can you don't want to have too much. You don't want to have too little. You know, you want it just right, like Goldilocks. Um, third, you you must um, nail the location through hooping. Um, again, you could you could sew something beautifully on a garment, but if it's you know diagonally cockeyed or uh, wrong placement, it doesn't look good. Um, not getting you the best results. And then fourth, um, maintain your equipment. Uh, sew at the correct speed. Make sure your tension is good. Um, because, again, everything else could be right. But if you're slacking at the machine portion, you're not going to get the best results. Um, embroidery can be very intimidating initially. Um, anybody who ever walks in our shop and sees the needle doing all the, you know, puncturing, it, it, they, they <laughs> think it's, you know, really, really complicated. But the truth of the matter is, I mean, you can do a lot of testing without spending hardly any money. I mean, thread, backing, it's when you sew a garment, you have very little material cost compared to a lot of printing methods. Um, the the it's more of the machine time and the labor yeah, that goes yeah. into it than the actual material cost. Um, you know, it, it, in a way, it's like screen printing. The material is low, but there's a higher skill set. There's more setup versus a lot of the digital print methods. Um, and I don't want to belittle any of those because I used to think, oh, it's just pushing a button. No, it's not. There's a lot of variables that go into them, but the material costs, the, the inks and so forth, are a lot more expensive. Uh, but with embroidery, you can really do a lot of testing and uh, fine-tuning without spending much money um, and just going to get some samples from the thrift store. Uh, but, you know, th this is a crash course overview. It, it there There's a lot more to it. Um, again, Eric ha writes for a lot of different magazines. Um, he has his own. Um, uh, what you have a podcast, right, Eric? What is it? Called? Yeah, I, I have a weekly show called The Take Up, uh, and that's uh, over on YouTube. But you can find it also at ericcampbell.com. And so I talk for about an hour to an hour and a half about digitizing topics. There's over a hundred plus episodes. I think we're in like 120 plus episodes now. I kind of did that through the pandemic. Started right before the pandemic happened. So that's that show's going on, and I'm also the producer of the Two Regular Guys podcast that you guys might be familiar with, kind of on Friday mornings. So you'll see a lot of me kind of out there talking about stuff. We do a, another little Q and A podcast after that called The Half earlier on in the morning. So Friday's a real busy day for me, <laughs> but I do <laughs> talk about that stuff live uh, every week, and honestly, take a lot of questions while I'm doing it. it if you contact me via my website, your question may end up being an hour and a half show if it's a good question. <laughs> You'll end up getting a class of your own every week. That's what everybody says. I always laugh because uh, people say, oh, I'm 
Eric, what time does your class start? I'm like, that was supposed to be a podcast, guys. I wasn't trying to, wasn't <laughs> trying to teach a class every week, but it is kind of how I do. I just tend to be a lecturer. <laughs> well, one thing we know about the industry, well, really anything in life, knowledge is power. And, yep, and yep. you know, the more knowledgeable you can be about um, really anything in the industry, the, the better it allows you to grow uh, and plan for your business. Um, and well, and it, here's the thing. This stuff sounds really complicated. It sounds kind of awful sometimes when you first hear about it and how much there is that goes into it. But it, I always kind of liken it to learning to drive a car when you're young. You Originally, you sit down in the car and you you shift the gears and you look at stuff and you're pressing the clutch and you're looking behind you and you're adjusting your mirrors and you're turning the wheel and you're looking up and down. And all of these different tasks feel separate and it feels like you have to do each one of them and focus on each one of them. But there comes a point where you get enough experience with it that eventually you're just driving. Your brain compresses all these things together and you kind of have a sense for what's going to happen when you tweak the buttons and, and turn the wheel. Uh, the same thing is going to be very indicative in embroidery. The same kind of stuff happens where at first you start out and you're worried about all the different stitch angles and the pull compensation and how much measurement has to be done for uh, you know, this overlap that's here and what do I have to do to get my density right and this kind of material versus another kind of material and even down to the hooping and the machine and everything else and everything feels very disjointed. There comes a point where you've had your hands on that fabric you understand this stuff kind of, I, I spent some time in Iceland, they have this really great phrase where they say, you understand things below your lower jaw, meaning that it's uh, no longer just in your head, you now really have experienced something. And with embroidery, you get there, especially if you get on a machine yourself, and operating is always going to make you a better digitizer. You understand the stretch of the fabric, you know how the machine operates, you know what's going to happen when you, you add tension to things, you know what it's going to look like. And you'll develop this eye for embroidery. You'll see the art and you know what kind of stitches are going to work for shapes of a certain shape and size. You kind of know what the garment's going to do under tension. And you'll be digitizing for the embroidery, not digitizing for what's on screen. And it becomes like driving. You're just digitizing. You'll very naturally throw the right amount of compensation. You'll very naturally break things up. Will you still be going back and forth and learning new things? Always. I learn new things all the time, even now. Um, but you eventually get to a point where there's kind of an understanding below your lower jaw of what fabric does and how all these different elements come together. And it becomes a lot more natural. It feels disjointed at first, but with experience, with testing on the right materials, and with giving yourself some time to have that scientific method, that retesting that we talked about, you will maintain and develop this feeling for it that makes it a lot more cohesive and makes it easier. Makes sense. Well, thank you so much, Eric, for your time today. Um, hopefully thank our you. audience uh, found this information helpful and they can make um, a, a good decision as to when uh, they start doing um, some of this stuff in-house and um, we've set some expectations as to when they make that leap. Uh, most people start with the heat press and you start mm. uh, pressing transfers. And before you know it, you know, you just keep adding pieces of equipment. And like I said, it, it's called Deco Network because it's printing and embroidery. Uh, that's what we, um, especially on the apparel side, um, th those are the decoration methods and embroidery isn't going anywhere. Um, I, you know, a lot of products print, other products embroidery, and um, when you're a one-stop shop, you don't have to turn the customer away to go to a competitor, and um, that's always going to help. There's tons of great shops out there that you can outsource to until you build up the demand. Uh, don't be afraid to do that, and Deco Network has started uh, building that community so you can touch base with other shops. Um, but again, thank you so much, Eric, for your time. Um, and hopefully we can do this again sometime and, and kind of take it to the next level where uh, we're going in a little bit more detail as to, you know, how to select the right thread and needles and so forth. But um, can't yeah, thank yeah. you enough. Um, and um, I know our audience will find this helpful. Well, thanks for having me. Thanks, Eric.